Well, welcome to this webinar that's a side meeting of the special session of the United Nations General Assembly against corruption. Our theme is Combating Corruption, the Relevance and Capacities of Faith-Based Organizations. Thank you for joining this program. Our panelists will represent both UN agencies and experience in the United Nations system, as well as diverse faith traditions with experience in combating proposing solutions to corruption, trafficking, public corruption, organized crime. And we will discuss particularly the role, the relevance, capacities of FBOs, faith-based organizations, and their work to prevent corruption, to intervene in efforts to improve ethics, justice, rule of law, good governance, and sustainable development. I'm Thomas Walsh. I'm chairman of the Universal Peace Federation and co-chair with Michael Plotzer of the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. I'd like to invite uh, co-chair Michael Plotzer, who will moderate the question and answer session after the panelists speak. Michael? Well, I, I am so happy that we are here. Um, we are now, this is the 14th webinar that we have organized in the last two years. Uh, I think it's a success, with, it's a great success that we have a super panel and, um, and that we are continuing in this, uh, these efforts to uh, involve faith-based organizations in promoting the work of the United Nations. So I think it's a good alliance and uh, we are happy that it, it's, uh, it's working so well. Well, thank you, Michael. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Jay Albanese. Uh, I don't know if Jay is uh, able to just say hello, but uh, he's a member of the steering committee of the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. Jay, if you just want to say a greeting. Yes, uh, very, very pleased to be here and uh, to reemphasize the importance of uh, civil society focusing today specifically on faith-based organizations. I believe as the other uh, segments of society, government and business do do their thing, uh, it's time to raise the voice even louder for civil society. And hopefully today is one step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albanese. Um, we hope, hope to hear from you, uh, as well as Michael, as we move toward the end. Uh, I now turn to our distinguished group of panelists. It's my uh, privilege to introduce our first speaker, none other than Ambassador Thomas Stelzer. Uh, the bios are listed in the chat column. You are invited to uh, put your questions in the chat column. Uh, you can address them to a specific panelist or to the panel in general. Uh, Dr. Ambassador Thomas Delser is Dean of the International Anti-Corruption Center based in Vienna. Ambassador Stelzer. Thank you very much. Greetings from New York. I'm participating from the UN headquarters. Uh, those of you who know the headquarters, you can easily uh, Defined that I'm sitting in the Indonesian lounge here, just outside the General Assembly Hall, where the plenary debate is still going on after the adoption of the policy document, uh, which was negotiated in preparation for the special session of the United Nations General Assembly Against Corruption, UNGAS 2021. This UNGAS 2021 is the highlight, the climax of a of a development which has been unfolding for 20 years. Uh, thinking back, it was in uh, 2001 uh, when I chaired my first uh, crime uh, prevention commission in Vienna. And that session adopted a document resolution confirming that corruption was a structural impediment 
to sustainable development. It was in 2001, before the negotiations uh, for the United Nations Convention Against Corruption have even started, exactly 20 years ago. So the first phase was dominated uh, by the negotiation of the convention, uh, which was then open for signature, as you remember, in 2003 in Merida, and which now needs to be implemented. And at about 2007, we were looking in Vienna, I was still permanent representative at that time at the United Nations in Vienna, at the very slow implementation uh, status of UNCAC, and we were kind of frustrated, thought, what can we do to facilitate quicker implementation of the convention? And UNCAC was and is a very valuable instrument, not only because it's the only universal instrument against corruption that exists with 186 uh, members, but it is a legal instrument which provides us with a legal framework uh, to, if implemented, fight corruption on the basis of the rule of law, excluding immunity. Now, you know that uh, very often in the United Nations context, uh, after the negotiations are concluded, member states uh, lose the energy. I don't have enough energy left to implement what they have negotiated. So to prevent UNCAC from becoming dead wood, but to become a very uh, relevant instrument implemented, we thought, how can we uh, facilitate its implementation? And this is where IACA, the International Anti-Corruption Academy, uh, Don Walsh Collars Center, which is not wrong. Uh, our name is Academy, but of course we are a center uh, in the fight against corruption, was established uh, in Luxembourg, close to Vienna. And the next stage of the process was the introduction of anti-corruption, the fight against corruption into the sustainable development goals. As target five in goal 16, which is the SDG that deals with good governance, with establishing structures which provide the framework for the implementation of all the other SDGs, the 16 SDGs. So that's somehow the framework. And uh, fighting against corruption is the cross cutting element uh, in the SDGs. It becomes clearer and clearer that considering the enormous amounts of money that are siphoned away from productive economies by corruption, by bribery, by all these illicit monetary flows, amounts that cannot be compensated for, neither by official development assistance, nor by uh, direct investments, nor by remittances. Uh, that to raise the money, to help member states raise the tax revenues, to make additional funds available for the implementation of the SDGs is only thinkable uh, if we have some success in the fight against corruption. So fight against corruption, success in the fight against corruption, a precondition for raising the money for implementation of SDGs, the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development, for keeping the world livable. And I think here we meet with the faith-based faith -based organizations. The member states of the United Nations decided to review the processes in a special session uh, of the General Assembly, UNGAS, uh, which is happening right now. Uh, I'm sure you're all very curious what has been happening here. You know, I listened very carefully to many of the statements of the last uh, two days, and I can report to you that there is a consensus that corruption needs to be fought. This is very reassuring. There was not one voice casting any doubt. Every speaker was reaffirming that we cannot afford any longer the negative costs, the externalities uh, that corruption caused to our economies, and that Fighting corruption, implementing UNCAC is in our shared interest. That's a big step forward. Now, of course, you know that there is a big step from declarations to implementation. And I think this is exactly where uh, the non-governmental organizations uh, come in. To hold those who make the decisions, who establish the 
networks to fight corruption, be it criminal networks or societal uh, networks that need to be resilient enough to allow for fighting corruption efficiently, to hold the decision makers accountable, uh, this is the biggest challenge. And, uh, you know, decision makers normally think in four year cycles, uh, they think about how to maximize voice uh, votes, uh, they have a rather uh, time limited uh, approach. And here, this is where NGOs come in with a long term perspectives and their responsibility to hold decision makers accountable to what they have promised, to make sure that the politicians do after having been elected what they promised before, and if not, had to hold them accountable at the next elections or in any uh, other way. So there needs to be a global coalition uh, to implement UNCAC and to fight uh, corruption uh, in all its aspects uh, sustainably. So what we have been doing at uh, IAC in Vienna, uh, we are technical assistance provider uh, in the field of education, you know, to help those who are supposed to implement the rather complex legal provisions of the convention in real life, need technical assistance first to understand the provisions and then uh, helping them build the capacity to really implement uh, the convention. This is what we have been doing. We have been reaching out. We have been offering to practitioners, to uh, lawyers, prosecutors, academicians, Justicial personnel, civil servants, helping them to gain the capacity to implement uh, the convention in their daily work. We have been offering two academic programs, two master's programs, one a little bit more academic, the other one more practically, uh, more compliance oriented, that have produced 3,000 alumni in 161 countries in the last 10 years. This is how long we have been working. Not me, myself, I just joined uh, the academy last year, but the academy as such has been there for 10 years. And the 3,000 alumni who have been become bridgeheads and uh, for the academy in their countries, uh, forming networks, multiplying what they have learned, uh, supported by our alumni network, of course, extremely valuable, but the numbers are not enough. So our big challenge now is how can we increase our diffusion capacity dramatically and not only reach 3,000 alumni, but reach every future diplomat, every future manager of the international system, but every future manager of the international of the global economy to help them first see where corruption happens, then Second, understand why fighting corruption is on shared interest. And then third, provide them with the technical assistance to fight corruption efficiently. Mr. Ambassador, this, yes. Yeah, I, I'm gonna need to, this is a fascinating and perfect opening statement, but I, I do need to move on. If you just uh, wrap up in the next uh, 30 seconds and then uh, we'll move on. But I really appreciate okay, thank it. Thank you, okay. You know, when you give you when you give an ambassador a microphone, you have to control him. Uh, also, have been looking at my watch. We try to stay within the seven minutes, but I think that's what it is. You cannot really conclude a statement like this because this is a process which is developing, uh, and we hope that UNGAS, which is happening now, will be a next step, opening the next phase towards the next COPS meeting, the meeting of the uh, UNCAC member states next December in. Uh, Egypt, where we can compensate for some of the shortcomings of the political outcome document, and where we can verticalize the fight against corruption uh, in the context of the global system, supporting the role of the UNODC and bringing together all the efforts, preventing to reinvent the wheel, becoming more targeted, more client oriented, working more on demand and uh, strengthening the impact of our fight against corruption. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, very much indeed uh, for this opening uh, statement, which is much, much appreciated. In the interest of time, I'd like to 
welcome uh, Dr. Levy Bautista, President of the Conference of Non-Governmental Organizations, or Congo, in consultative relationship with uh, the United Nations. Uh, Dr. Bautista, Thank welcome. You, Thank you indeed for having me again uh, in, 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 in this webinar. Uh, you have invited me in one of this series of wonderful seminars that you have uh, uh, conducted. Uh, and thank you for assembling a, a panel such as this to discuss uh, something of very urgent and, uh, and relevant uh, matter that must be uh, attended to uh, and must concern faith-based organizations. Today, I speak to this theme more in my role as main representative of the United Methodist Church at the United Nations. But even that, I should also say that as president of Congo, the conference of NGOs in consultative relationship with the United Nations, the organization is very much involved in the work, uh, especially of UNODC. I see in the participants a number of uh, members of NGO committees of Congo, uh, courtesy of our good relationship with uh, Mirela Dumar Frahi of the Civil Society Office of UNODC in Vienna. The United Methodist Church has a long history of faith engagement in the public square. The photo next to the UN headquarters de depict the church center for the United Nations, which is a United Methodist uh, property. And the other building right next to the US Capitol is the United Methodist Building, where our witness and advocacy as a religious body are given tangible expressions in local and international arena. I'm especially grateful to the organizers for assembling an interfaith panel to speak to the very issue that is the burden of this meeting. Religious NGOs today are serious interlocutors for religious ethical and spiritual understandings, informing and influencing the development of international law and ethics. The active participation of civil society, notably religious NGOs at the UN, allows for mutual advancement of the charter mandates of the UN, including a recognizable place at the UN for religious, spiritual, moral, and ethical perspectives. Combating corruption in all its forms is part of that central tenet of all religions that are about the prospering of values and norms that make for the flourishing of all human beings and the planet they all share. What we call the United Methodist Social Principles in my church testify to Methodists' long history of concern for social justice in a manner that is prayerful and thoughtful and an effort to speak to the human issues that we confront in the contemporary world. Early Methodists expressed their opposition to the slave trade, to smuggling, and to the cruel treatment of prisoners. Today, our social principles address squarely the matter of graft and corruption. United Methodist social teachings emphasize that the system of justice God desires for us focuses on healing and restoration. It heals the wounds of the victims, addresses the wrongs of the perpetrator, restores society to wholeness and stops, not perpetuates, cycles of systemic evil. At the core of criminal justice reform, especially in combating corruption, must be the concern to address the harm that our actions have done on the human person to their dignity and to their relations in community. That's about the violations of human rights and moving to righting the relations that have been broken by the harm. The restoration of relations is what many sacred religious texts refer to the fullness of life. Graft and corruption frustrates and subverts that fullness of life. Here is what we say as United Methodists on graft and corruption, something that echoes very well the UN Convention Against uh, Corruption. I quote, God's good creation, the fullness of its bounty and the loving, nurturing relationships that bind all together 
are intended by God to be enjoyed in freedom and responsible stewardship. To revere God's creation is a sacred trust that enables us to fashion just, equitable, sustainable relationships and communities. The strength, stability, security, and progress of such relationships and communities depend on the integrity of their social, economic, political, and cultural processes, institutions, and stakeholders. It continues, graph, referring to unfair or illegal means of acquiring money, gain, or advantage, especially by abusing one's position in politics, business, and social institutions, including religious institutions, transgresses human dignity and violates human rights. Corruption, referring to dishonest and undue exploitation of power for personal gain, subverts God's intention for the fullness of life and creation. We therefore say that graft and corruption tangle the social thread of communities, they erode the moral fiber of human relationships, and solid the reputation of social institutions. Legislative and judicial mechanisms, and I may say the UN Convention is one of those, including a strong, just criminal justice system must deal with graft and corruption at every level of society. Good, just political governance, characterized by transparency, accountability, and integrity is crucial to the eradication of graft and corruption. Societies that are graft ridden and plagued with corruption are needful of God's pardoning love and redeeming grace. That's the official position of the United Methodist Church. It echoes what uh, the, the concern of the uh, uh, June 1, 2020 uh, General Assembly Resolution 74 slash 276 that, that corruption threatens the stability and security of societies and that corruption undermines democratic institutions, they slow economic development and contributes to governmental instability. With the rich and outreach of religious bodies, there is much that religious and faith-based institutions can do in supporting the convention. Indeed, there is much reason for faith-based bodies to engage in anti-corruption activities because anti-corruption work is about restorative justice. It is and a combating of extractivism, which corruption is. It entails even more focused protection of human dignity and prevention of human rights violations that deter graft and corruption. So combating corruption is a way to restore right relations. And, and here, the, the intersection of anti-corruption uh, with the uh, positive campaigns for the uh, fulfillment of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, as uh, Ambassador Stelzer already emphasized, especially SDG 16, are, are very important so that the human fabric and the planetary fabric, the achievement of peace and prosperity are achieved uh, and, and not undermined by the graft and corrupt activities of people and societies. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Walls, I'll end it there and would welcome uh, 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 exchange with, with the uh, audience uh, when we're done. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bautista. Uh, as, as always, you are a very well organized and concise, and uh, you bring uh, your uh, presentation with the good graphics and uh, clear articulation. And I, I learned a lot uh, emphasizing the fullness of life and the restoring of right relations and uh, extractivism, that corruption is a form of extractivism. So thank you very much indeed. We'll now move happily to uh, uh, Imam Sheikh Mohammed Ismail he is, of course, the Muslim chaplain at the University of Sheffield in the Sheffield, the UK. I'm happy to say as well and thankful that he is a distinguished member of the steering committee of the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. 
so Imam Sheikh Mohammed Ismail, we want to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Chair and Co-Chair, and uh, Right Honorable Ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. First of all, I greet you with the greeting of peace. And I hope and pray that our this session will benefit those people who are in tyranny and pain because of corruption. I begin in the name of Almighty God, the most merciful, the most gracious. And I send salutations on all the prophets of Almighty God who were sent as guides for mankind. As you all know that almost all faith and religions are based on moral and ethical principles to help the followers to protect themselves from all forms of corruption in the society. Similarly, Islam as a religion has very clear and strict rules in the Holy Quran and also in the teaching of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The rules clearly condemn any such practices which lead to any form of corruption in, in, the, in the communities. In many verses, which are actually numbered 47, there is warning of anger from Almighty God against corruption. And the traditions of the Prophet is given clearly indicate that such people who are involved in the corruption are not among the community or not regarded as to be in the community. The World Economic Forum 2021 report says that corruption cost developing countries $1.26 trillion every year. Yet half of Europe, Middle East and Asian countries think that it is acceptable. And there are several lists of global indexing of almost all the countries of the world in line with their perceived num uh, you know, numbers in corruption. And they start from one to 180. And the indexing authorities are the United States of America, World Economic Forum, Transparency International, and those that are texting in the audience, they can join Transparency Inter um, International, which is working against corruption, World Bank, and many more. But these actually lists are based on the perception. So corruption is perhaps best described as a smelling force which perpetrate po poverty, so insecurity, and robs the world's actually mm. most vulnerable people of desperately needed public service. It can manifest in many forms from criminal acts like bribery, extortion, embezzlement to highly questionable, uh, but sometimes legal practices like nepotism, patronage, and cronyism. Most corruption takes place in the shadow, away from the praying eyes of public scrutiny. And this sometimes makes it precise impact difficult to quantify, but pick any country in the world that is representative democracy, a one party state or a military dictatorship, and you will find a common thread. They are all grappling with problems that stem from the corruption. I quoted this from the Transparency International recent report on corruption matters. Corruption is a widespread global problem that has far reaching negative consequences on all aspects of life. Muslim majority countries are most often ranked as highly corrupt by the transparency organization. Yet the religious aspects is not mentioned as a factor in most reports. Almost all studies about corruption are 
undertaken from the perspective of developed countries. In Islam, the concept of bribery is very wide. It includes anything that is offered in order to obtain the invalidation of what is correct or an endorsement of a wrong action. Not only is this unlawful, it is a major grave sin. And there are so many verses in the Holy Quran, as I said, you know, 47, I gathered here, but if I start quoting them, you will take, you know, a very long time. When bribery become an acceptable factor in societies, it leads to a loss of rights and prevalence of injustice and corruption. That is why, you know, the prophet condemn such action. And also there are other examples from the traditions of the prophet, which are very clearly, you know, indicating to uh, making a duty that people must stop corruption. And there is a concept, an agreement that the largest proportion of the world population are following some kind of faith or religion. Religion provides the foundation of ethics mostly and religious also uh, economically poor countries where religions are practiced compared to economically developed countries where religious are less in practice. And we see that there are evidence that religious practices are not in any way linked to corruption. However, according to statistics, financial corruption is much higher in the poor countries compared to the rich countries. One of the worst form of corruption is stealing public money in highest amount and banking it abroad in the rich countries. In most cases, the stolen public money is either from foreign development aid for poor people, from loans taken from rich countries, or commission from sales of arms or forms of contracts of development projects. The main causes for such corruption are greed of money, desire of becoming rich quickly, achieving higher political and financial position, and it causes as a result of weak democracy, poor governance, lack of people, uh, civil, civic or civil participation, lack of trust in the system and lack of transparency and powerful actually uh, unelected bureaucracy and weak administrative structure with no press freedom or additional factors for correction to grow. Another reason, for corruption is strict control of economic freedom. The corruption hurts everybody in the society and particularly poor people. And corruption erodes the trust in the public sector to act in the best interest of general public. It also wastes taxes and government collected revenues, which put effect on the important community development projects which means public have to put up with poor quality services or infrastructure or miss out altogether on health, basic life, communities, corruption, and also corruption improve, increase income inequality and poverty through lower economic growth and by the tax system favoring the rich people. Faith and religious organization can play a vital role and in combating corruption in all society. In poor countries, faith-based organization can openly condemn corruption and challenge corrupt regimes. They can raise awareness among the general public and work with international organizations such as UN Transparency International to work against corruption in their respective region and countries. In the Western countries, faith-based organization can demand the rich countries to take action against corrupt politicians, officials, or rulers who steal wealth from their poor countries and deposit them in the rich Western countries 
who are equally regarded as partners in this corruption, in my view. Therefore, faith organization, ladies and gentlemen, faith organization and the UN must work closely to get poor countries out of this tyranny of corruption. Thank you very much. I hope I have not exceeded my time. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Imam Mohammed Ismail. An excellent uh, presentation and thank you for representing Islam and uh, so effectively and pointing out how corruption hurts everyone, erodes trust and the role, important role that faith-based organizations can play in combating corruption. Our last speaker, none other than Bishop Munib Yunan, former president, Lutheran World Federation, Honorary President, Religions for Peace, will speak to us by video message. He has a, a seven-minute video that has been prepared, and we will now show. And straight away after, we will have about 15 minutes for question and answer. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I greet you from Jerusalem that ask for your prayers for peace and justice. Thank you for inviting me to address a very relevant topic, combating corruption. This is a very important theme as we together search for a world of justice in all sectors of life. I would like, first of all, to share three examples from my biblical passage. First, King David committed adultery with his neighbor, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. God sent his prophet Nathan, who gave him a story of two men, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb that treated her like a daughter. The rich man gave the traveler who came to visit the lamb the poor of the poor man. King David got angry and wanted to punish the rich man who committed this sin of injustice. Prophet Nathan said to him, you are the man. This biblical story teaches us two things. It's always easier to condemn the corruption of the other and give a blind eye to ours. Secondly, God has zero tolerance for corruption, for sexual exploitation and abuse. My second example, there is a story of Jesus cleanses the temple. As he went for prayers, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. He overturned the tables of the merchants and many mon and, and money changers. And he said, stop making my father's house a marketplace. This teaches us that the holy places should be places of worship and prayer, not places of conflict or merchandise or war, or in simple ways, do not use religion for your personal petty interests. Do not abuse religion and its sublime teaching, loving God and loving your neighbor. The third example, in the Acts of the Apostles, there was a magician um, uh, called Simon in Nablus, which was used to be called Shechem, who converted to Christianity, but also St. Peter and St. John laying hands on the believers and receiving the Holy Spirit. Simon, the magician, offered the disciples money in order that he may have the same talents to lay hands and receive the Holy Spirit and give it to the believers. But St. Peter said to him, may your silver, may your silver perish because you thought you could obtain God's gifts with money. We hear in this story that Simon 
wants to buy in inappropriate ways goods and payments and make religion only a good and a payment. This is simply bribery. That is corruption per se. My biblical tradition is rich in combating all kinds of corruption. Some may ask, why does our world and the UN expose the issue of corruption today? It existed at all times, even in history. Isn't the social media making the corruption more appealing? I do not think so. In a globalized way, in a globalized world, we are more interdependent than ever. We are more interdependently accountable to each other. Our relations should be built on such a morality that respects the integrity of oneself and the dignity of the other. For this reason, Faith-based organizations are to closely work to find the common values from our various traditions and work for transparency and accountability, as well as combating any kind of corruption, be it bribery, lobbying, extortionism, cronyism, nepotism, parochialism, patronage, influence peddling, fraud, sexual harassment, graft, or embezzlement. Corruption and its impunity erode the trust in the public sector to act in their best interests. Corruption leads to weak governance, which in turn fuels organized groups or promotes crimes such as human trafficking, arms and migrant smuggling, counterfeiting, and trade in underground societies. Corruption weakens economic development and perpetuate poverty levels and social inequalities. Corruption obstructs equality and justice in our world. And as faith-based organization, we ought to be the voice of the conscience in our world where there is corruption, we should dare to address it and not find excuses we should dare to speak the truth, even in these time of time, even if that person belongs to us. I have served seven years the Lutheran World Federation, and we have worked for transparency and accountability all the time and continue to work in our Lutheran World Federation. As, and it is based on our faith. As people of faith, Rooted in the gospel, we uphold the principle that each human being has received his or her, dig her dignity as a gift of God and therefore needs to be respected and protected. This fundamental insight rooted in our faith needs to be expressed coherently in the ways we meet and interact, interact in events that brings us together. I would like to say how we did it in three ways. One, there is a clear policy of transparency on all levels, from top to down, from down to top. LWF keeps revenging its policies. It always conducts risk assessment. It, it continues to train its staff. LWF monitors strict procedures in its works and I can clearly say it is a very transparent and accountable faith-based organization. Secondly, LWF staff has a code of conduct regarding sexual exploitation of abuse, abuse of power, fraud, and corruption. And every employee, every, every uh, officer, every person has to sign these basic this uh, code of conduct. Basic ethical commitments and standards are to be lived out in the work of LWF. They include respect for the dignity and integrity of all human beings, fair and just treatment of all without discrimination, exploitation, or harassment, 
responsible stewardship in the exercise of power and use of financial and um, for financial and other resources respect of diversity inclusiveness and participation and transparency and accountability and being also you know uh, being also sensitive to the context thirdly before the start of any lwf event two members to form the complaint handling commitment co committee chc are and are identified preferably one woman and one man the chs members will receive a short briefing from the event organized and they they clarify the code of conduct and procedures to follow at the beginning of the meeting events in its first session the organizer reminds all participants about the code of conduct the focal persons are introduced focal persons draw the attention of all participants to the code of conduct and the commitment of lwf to uphold them should anyone need to make a complaint either they approach a member of the chc or fill out a complaint form and send it by email to the complaint address given all complaints are dealt with carefully and promptly and measures are taken measures are taken according to the incidents when we speak on combating a corruption i strongly believe that civil society faith based organization and small businesses should have clear policies as lwf does transparency and accountability starts at home we should be transparent and accountable not for the others for ourselves because then our conscience will be clear if we grow up and honest um, and a society of integrity then as faith based organization we have achieved our goal of of being more just and equal societies where every citizen every human being has equal opportunity and knows that whatever is done is accountable may god bless us in combating corruption because we want a world of justice god bless you uh, thank you very much uh, bishop munib yunan from uh, jerusalem it's now after 1 a.m uh, in the morning so we are grateful to have your video message i'm now going to turn it over after these excellent presentations from our, our panelists to uh, michael plotzer to uh, offer some questions i think we'll go into gallery mode and uh, of the panelists plus uh also jay albanese if he's able to still be with us who will make a few closing comments uh so uh dr platzer if you'd moderate the discussion and uh if uh, we could move into gallery view for the okay. panelists uh, i hope i'm i'm heard and um we have six questions at the moment um i don't they're not all addressed to individuals but uh, raise a little bit of uh, i don't know reality let's call it about the whole problem one is the the circle that uh, has been described uh, roughly of uh, how uh, the poor countries who have a, a low uh, report yeah. uh, are transferring money to the rich countries banks and uh, these are kept uh, very happily in the UK, Canada, USA, Austria. Um, so this cycle of money that moves back to the um, the rich countries, perhaps we should focus more on them. And these are comments from two people, from two countries. Um, we have also someone uh, from Africa uh, talking. We don't seem to. Have talk too much about the whistleblowers the really the the heroes who risk their lives often and go and identify 
the issues and often end up in jail themselves. So I wonder if there are people who would like to deal with these questions. Otherwise, uh, we will. Um, there's a, there are some other questions. So, but let me go through this round, please. Does anyone have a response to my these issues? Dr. Platzer, oh. uh, one of the questions was actually uh, actually mentions me, and if I could respond, I. I, uh, the, this is the question from Nkwedi Roland Tisha uh, of, of Cameroon. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether my response will be satisfactory. It's simply to say that, that uh, Mr. Tisha's uh, concern about the, the punishment of, of whistleblowers uh, is, is indeed repugnant. And I think as much as possible that parliaments and congresses of national governments and act, enacting laws for the protection of whistleblowers uh, for the, uh, so that there is a, a juridical forum, if you will, for the verification of any allegations of, of bribery, uh, corruption, or any other acts inimical to what I called earlier to the fullness of life, to the, to the sanctity of, of the human person and their capacity to use time, talent, and treasure in a way that is good stewardship rather than extracted uh, unduly from them uh, by people in power, people in that have access to the structures of, of governance. That's why the concern for uh, against corruption is very much the concern, not just for good governance, but for just relations. So just to end this, uh, when, when uh, the, the, uh, the person who asked the question said, what can be done? Uh, the matter of legislation to protect le uh, whistleblowers is, is one thing. It's another for societies, uh, nation states, if you will, to provide for economic security to combat poverty. And that's the connection to SDGs, combating poverty so that the fertile ground for graft and corruption is erased. And, and rather the fertile ground should be about plenty and plenitude so that no one must bribe to be able to get food on the table or something like that. Okay. Um uh, Tom, may I, uh, I have two more questions, please. Uh, one uh, just came in. It's about, uh, should we not look at the religious institutions themselves, uh, where they are committing crimes and uh, taking money from uh, organized criminal groups? Uh, we've heard about that in about the banks in, in Rome. And the other is a more generic question. Um, I think uh, Livia also mentioned that this whole thing is based on morality. Uh, and shouldn't we look at ourselves that uh, how do we get rid of the self-centeredness of the human being um, who, who has uh, an interest to get rich, to become uh, important, to have his family be taken care of? How do we deal with uh, self-centeredness of the basic drive of the corruption. So I have two of those two questions. Anyone want to take them? Is Thomas Stelzer still with us? Uh, Ambassador Stelzer had a, another appointment at uh, just uh, 30 minutes ago. He had to exit. Okay. Um, Maybe I can just add a, a brief word, uh, put on a moral philosopher hat or moral theologian. You know, there is, there's also the theory that self centeredness or self-interest at some point expands beyond just hedonism for the self into recognizing, as others have said, that the corruption actually undermines our own self-interests. So in some respects, we should get rid of corruption for selfish reasons sometimes. So <laughs> back to you, Michael. Okay. I, I, no, no, I think, I think the 
the other question was answered really by um, Mr. Bautista. Uh, yeah, Mr. Bautista about how religious organizations have to be careful themselves about uh, corruption and uh, uh, and, Dr. Platzer, I, and Dr. Platzer, I would not even say they should also. In fact, in the history of religious institutions, their entanglement and complicity in corruption and other forms of subversion of the integrity of creation and of the fullness of life is tangible. We know that it is a burden of all religious institutions that once, you know, once their institutions are incorporated and, and are part of the social institutions, uh, religious institutions can no longer hide under their sacred texts because then their sacred texts are equally muddied by, by practices of corruption. And I think there is no, religious institutions are warned not to exempt themselves from such acts because, because history bears out the complicity of religious institutions and of religious leaders. And so the, the, the enactment of agreed uh, of agreements, of normative agreements, as in international law, like the UN Convention, exempts no one. And I think that's the way to go, rather than providing a, a blanket of, uh, of protection for religions in the way we, I, I don't think corruption exempts religion in the, in the examination of church state and religion state relations. Where one cannot, where one cannot interfere in the activities of the other, corruption certainly uh, is not one of those uh, that that uh, governmental institutions uh, uh, cannot uh, look into if if uh, religious institutions are are engaging in those activities. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we've reached the end of the questions and the time, so Tom. Well, maybe, maybe then if I can just suggest maybe uh, uh, Imam Mohammed to say a, a closing word, then I'd like to ask uh, Jay Albanese to just offer a few thoughts or reflections on, on what he's observed and uh, any final comments. Sheikh uh, Mohammed. I want thank you very much. I'm, 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 first of all, I would like to uh, you know, thank the uh, uh, the organization, the United Peace uh, uh, Forum for um, you know, and the Coalition of Faith-Based Organization for you know taking uh, the responsibility of you know taking care of those people who are most affected by, affected by the corruption uh, uh, around the world. And particularly in the third world countries. And I will say that for religious organization from any faith, it is very important that they follow strict ethics guidelines and also, you know, take the corruption out. Of, it is very difficult, I, I agree with you, that it is very difficult to completely eradicate the corruption. But, um, you know, there are countries in the world, they are, you know, working very hard to address the corruption. And what I said that on the Transparency International website, if, you know, there is a database of, you know, the, 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 the broadsheet uh, database, uh, which is actually clearly indicating that, and people can go and have a look and see and can join uh, very easily the organization and report and read their reports. What is important here, that one is the financial corruption, which is very much the bureaucracies and the dictatorships and all those non-democratic countries where people are stealing money of poor people and bringing it to the West. And the West is not, actually it's, it's not doing enough to stop that. And I think it's very important for the United Nation as they are addressing at the moment, the terrorism and other you know, financial supports, they must address corruption as well. 
or briberies or corruption or, or whatever. The other thing is that clearly some countries would know that the arms sales and what is called the, the commissions and so on and so forth that need addressing. But what is important here is another form of corruption, probably genocide, you know, discrimination against minorities in countries and uh, intentional um, ethnic cleansing and, 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 and so many other and sexual harassment, uh, gender inequalities um, and abuse of women. All these things comes under corruption. And I think they, 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 they need to be addressed. So I think if we work together as faith organization, faith-based coalition and the United Peace Forum, I think there is a lot to do and with the United Nations. But the United Nations need to be sharpen its agenda to, to, to remind its members their responsibility in this regard. Because this corruption is terribly affecting the third world countries. And there, is no, there are no health amenities, there are no sanitation, the basic, the basic human facilities are not there for millions and millions of people. And it is not fair. And if we don't care, then these people will have to find other solutions, which will be uh, uh, an irony and a disaster. Thank you very much for, once again, thank you, Michael, and thank you, uh, uh, Tom, or, or Dr. Thomas Welsh, for you know, organizing this event and to the United Nations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, Dr. J. Albanese, you have the final word. The final word is a question uh, which I've just dropped into the chat. And it's, it's a question for, for reflection, I think, for, for all of us. And to me, the takeaway question is, how can faith-based organizations make a larger difference in the global concern about corruption and justice in the lives of their constituents, in your home countries, and, and globally? This is an issue of organization, of strategy, of thoughtfulness. And I think uh, there's a lot of uh, motivated, intelligent people who I think can be mobilized for uh, to make a larger difference than is being made under the current circumstances. So I encourage this to be the uh, beginning of a discussion rather than the end of one. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us today. I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, we will uh, post this webinar on the website uh, of all the co-organizers, uh, particularly the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations, and uh, we will send all the panelists uh, the link so you will have your, your own uh, copy of the recording. Uh, it's been a splendid panel. Uh, and uh, very grateful for each one of you and your uh, interventions and bringing insight and wisdom to the discussion, including Bishop Munib Yunan, who uh, delivered a wonderful address by uh, video. We're sorry we could not get to all the questions in the chat due to the limitations of time. We're grateful to our audience and uh, uh, Michael, anything you wanna say? Yeah, I do want to apologize to the questions that came in after uh, we closed. Uh, there, there was, a, it's a very interesting, and I think Olivia uh, and, uh, can answer some of those questions. And uh, it's obviously the discussion has just started as Jay says, uh, and I'm glad we had such a powerful panel. And I hope we can also get this in some sort of written form. I, I'm, uh, I think this, uh, this was really a high quality discussion. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Okay, we, we are out of time. Thank you. Let's stay in touch. Let's work together. We have many good suggestions. Even the questions have stimulated us. And although we couldn't uh, give them their due entirely during this uh, webinar. Uh, the conversation has just begun. I think that's our concluding reason, and we have a lot of work to do. So thank you all. God bless you.
And uh, for those of you continuing with uh, the UNGAS program, I uh, hope that it all goes well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.